my lovely, lovely imps. Today, I'm going to be addressing another YouTuber. A YouTuber that many of you might be familiar with. A YouTuber by the name of ContraPoints. And specifically, I'm going to be addressing a number of claims, questions, open-ended comments that ContraPoints, also known as Natalie, uh, has made on social media recently, uh, mostly that seem to be in the fallout of Joe Biden's disastrous debate performance in the first 2024 presidential debate, and uh, that also seem to be heavily connected to the absolute apocalyptic panic going on within the Democratic Party about the electability of Joe Biden. Now, uh, this is going to be a pretty uh, intense uh, and, and structured uh, segment, and I will be getting to chat, but probably a little bit later on, so please don't feel insulted if I don't immediately respond. I prepared a big response to a lot of this, and I want people to understand that I tried to approach this in the absolute best faith possible. I really mean this. I truly hope that what I say here can make sense uh, to, if ContraPoints is ever to see this, I don't know if that will ever happen, whether it does or doesn't. If people who feel similarly to ContraPoints see this, I want what I say here to make sense to them and to make them feel like their points are being dealt with in good faith. It is a complicated topic, uh, and the topic is, of course, electoralism and anti-electoralism. This is a extremely hot-button topic that has been sort of cycling through online left-leaning political discourses for a long time. Um, I have, at various points, made my opinion on it open, but I wanted to do so in a more structured fashion in a direct response today. So I hope that you'll join me for that. Without any further ado, let us start um, with the thread in question, okay? This was a thread that was made on uh, Twitter by ContraPoints just, uh, uh, just two days ago. So let's read it. ContraPoints says, it's really, really easy to caricature the anti-electoralist left as online misanthropes whose politics is firebomb a Walmart and then not firebombing a Walmart. This is a reference to a uh, insufferable and overused tweet that has become a brainworm meme in my opinion, but just, it's not the actual tweet, it's just a reference to it. So. Sorry, I hear the tweet so much. It would help to dispel that myth if they were more vocal about what specifically their methods have achieved. We are all frustrated that the Democrats aren't stronger, more effective, further left, savvier about strategy. But the Democrats can at least point to some significant accomplishments in the last four years. A major climate bill, infrastructure investment, nominating Justice Jackson. What has the, what has the anti-electoralist left accomplished in the same time frame? I remember in 2020, a lot of mutual aid funds going around for protesters and people hit by the pandemic. That counts as an achievement. But what else? Anything on the level of influence as a major climate bill? As someone terrified by the prospect of Trump returning to power, can you reassure me that there's a plausible direct action slash non-electoralist means of stopping him that's more likely to succeed than electing Biden or Harris? Because if not, I think you are a LARPer. And no, posting a picture of me next to Hillary Clinton does not count as an argument. So that's the thread. And allow me to respond. You are asking a faction with fundamentally different politics from yourself to aim for achievements that they cannot influence, that you also cannot influence. Go right now with your action today 
and meaningfully influence the, the selection of a Supreme Court justice. You can't do that. Only the president can do that. Only the president can do that when there's an opening on the Supreme Court, provided it's not challenged and delayed until the end of another election. Damn. Go influence the passing of a climate bill. Oh, you don't have access to that? You have to rely on a representative who may or may not actually keep their campaign promises and who you cannot vote for or against for multiple years after you vote for them in the first place? Like, for example, the biggest example recently is John Fetterman. You don't have the connections or income to sustainably lobby, or maybe you took time out of your day. So you were, uh, uh, you took time out of your day to go lobby, and then you just ended up getting uh, snarked at or ignored. Like that time when Nancy Pelosi was snarking and uh, uh, making fun of anti-genocide protesters and told them to go back to China. Or the time that she tried to in silence the protest of, uh, of uh, d endangered immigrant youth. Influencing federal level politics is extremely fraught. There are no factions except for the current ruling power who can reliably claim to influence federal level politics. And that even as we'll get into is fraught. Unless you yourself become deeply a part of the political machine in a way that distances you from your current values and your current life, you can't keep your current job, you can't keep your current friends, that kind of thing, you got to devote your life to either Democratic or Republican careerism, you don't actually have a say. These are things that can only be highly abstractedly influenced. That's not the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. Your one vote, and maybe the votes of a couple of your friends that you can convince might matter in a very small way, but you can't know that. Sometimes, even when you get everybody else together and vote, uh, like you know, with Hillary, the popular vote wins and it still doesn't matter. The problem I have is the fact that these machines ask for your lifeblood. How do you think that progressives who went and dumped their money and times, uh, uh, their time and their lives, their actual literal effort supporting Fetterman feel? How do you feel uh, how do you think the people who went and devoted a whole ton of time to Jamal Bowman only to have his career get blown out of the water by a last minute cash injection feel? Do you think that they feel represented by what happened? What can they even do? They didn't get the power. In the case of Fetterman, Fetterman got the power and decided to do whatever he wanted with it. And that's even at an edge case where we're talking about local elections that can be actually influenced by a still fairly large amount of people, but by a group of people. On the federal level, most of us, nearly all of us, are victims of a machine that moves with no regard for us whatsoever. All of us reading these Twitter posts could all go and cast our votes for Biden right now. Statistically, anybody listening to this and talking about this almost assuredly will vote for Biden. And he could still eat shit against Donald Trump. The anti-electoral camp, just like ContraPoints, who I don't know if you'll ever see this, but if you do, just like you, is not actually allowed federal power. The anti-electoral camp just recognizes that and aims to build a politics that can seize power for themselves and those around them with what they can actually reach and touch in their lives. Definitionally, this type of politics does not take the form of acts of Congress or presidential edicts. Feeding people so that they can live another day, participating in acts of protest that physically demand responses, compiling and distributing vital information, all of these are things that are both diffused and direct. So they happen across lots of different people and they are person to person, a person helping another person or a group of people helping another group of people. I wanted to take this particular moment here before we jump into a bunch of other things that I have to say to talk about some examples offhand that have nothing to do with electoralism whatsoever, but that also illustrate the fact that uh, while there isn't a binary between uh, a strict binary between 
electoralism and non-electoral actions, that there are sacrifices that have to be made. Let me give an example. Helping trans refugees escaping red states, okay? This is a task that requires communal familiarity and a willingness to be incredibly vulnerable and incredibly personally generous, okay? It also directly and immediately saves lives. It is incredibly important that people are willing to do this, and we need as many people being willing to help people out as possible. Personally, I have never met a Democratic staffer who had housed a, a trans refugee. Of all of the people, and I know a lot of people who have helped trans people get out of red states, I have never known one of them to be a Democratic representative. It's not impossible that a Democratic representative or a Democratic agent or whatever uh, helps somebody get out of a red state, but Democratic Party people are often tied up in other more important business. Their life and career and connections begin to be centered around the machine of democratic politics. They tend to not have the time, the connections, and sometimes not even the money to be able to actually help in this way. Let me give some other examples. Volunteering and working at public clinics, food banks, and shelters. These are acts that require application of developed skills, skills which, are, uh, uh, which take time to develop and are also not very valued by political machines. If you're trying to work your way up through the Democratic Party, you are going to be you know, cultivating skills that are different than the skills that you need to go work at a public health clinic, to go work at a food bank, or to take care of people at a shelter. There is just a simple calculus of time there. You only have so much time you can spend. An RN who goes and pursues work at a public LGBTQ clinic is going to save many lives. But that, that is never going to actually appear in an electoral lens. It, it, it just doesn't. You're not going to see that in the electoral lens. Another example, developing networks of medicinal access. Uh, this includes things like antibiotics, chronic pain management, HRT, diabetes meds, there are many, many, many people who are completely cut out of the current healthcare system who need help accessing medicine regularly right now for their lives to be able to go on. People who help them do so sometimes at great personal risk, not always legally, mind you, but, uh, uh, but, but personal risk. So an example might be, say you put up a HRT informational page and you suddenly get targeted by a bunch of deranged right-wingers who hate you for existing. You haven't broken any laws, but you are suffering nonetheless. Here's another example. I wanted to list all these things out of things that are non-electoral, that are often ignored by the electoral lens, and that anti-electoral people try to get people to pay more attention to. And this is just, off, this is just what I could come up with off the, off the cuff. Okay, climate resilience work, whether it's organizing carpools to ensure people get to work while reducing carbon output, that's a very small level one, volunteering to care for the environment by taking care of local parks and shared spaces, there's like a medium level one, or overt acts of resistance like those undertaken by groups like Just Stop Oil and other climate groups. Um, all of these groups operate outside of an electoral lens, and yet they directly impact the world around them. A small team of volunteers taking their time to make a local park a livable space can change the lives of an entire city community. A small team of people willing to make a large public statement can fundamentally change huge masses of people's opinions and therefore decisions. One last example here. Skill and knowledge sharing. Everything from access to restricted and banned media to, archi and, uh, to archival work to collecting, parsing, and communicating difficult but vital topics like how to create medicine, how to uh, do engineering, you know, at-home engineering, how to be able to do household mechanics. These are knowledge types that are often barred away from the average person. And participating in these things is invisible to the electoral lens, 
but is accessible to those who spend their time building these things, and they're vital. The electoralist lens is a myopic and twisted worldview. And I genuinely don't understand why, why it's become the default outside of just propaganda. Because I think that, that on the left, there is a, a tendency towards people wanting to think differently. And yet, nonetheless, so much of the left has sort of slowly and surely walked its way right back into basically just saying Democratic Party, just towing the line with the Democratic Party. I don't understand how it's possible for people who recognize that all things are political to ultimately conclude that basically nothing is political except basically voting. I think it's a distorted worldview, and I'm tired of pretending that it's not. I think this worldview is going to kill us. Now, I want to address a, at this point, I'm going to sort of move into addressing a couple of specific points brought up by ContraPoints. Um, and the first one I'm going to bring up is uh, this tweet. And I'm going to quote it again real quick. This is what ContraPoint said. As someone terrified by the prospect of Trump returning to power, can you reassure me that there's a plausible direct action, non-electoralist means of stopping him that's more likely to succeed than electing Biden or Harris? Because if not, I think you're a LARPer. I'm going to get into the the language and the delivery and the decisions and the revealing parts as we get a little bit further in but for the time being i just want to address this at face value okay no one can give you assurance that donald trump won't come to power without lying to you there is literally nobody who can promise that no one what you are asking for is someone to tell you something that they can't promise. It is not in any one person or even one single group's power who is going to end up getting the presidency in November. Okay? There's no one group that has that decision. That outcome is in so many ways completely out of all of our hands. What non-electoralists can offer is ways to protect ourselves from his power. Ways of stopping him that involve disempowering the harm that he could and will do. Structures of communal power that can ensure that we survive even if he takes power. And I do believe that there is a very good chance that Donald Trump will be taking power in November. I think that it would be foolish to act, that that, to act as if that isn't a very distinct possibility. Regardless of Biden... And, and the Supreme Court and any other single flashpoint issue, the election goes down between two people. There is always a chance that the candidate you don't want is going to win. When you add everything else back in, it gets way more complicated. I think what this is, is a crisis of faith among liberals. And I think that a lot of lefties or left-leaning people have essentially bought in to the faith and are also having a crisis of faith. The institutions that liberals trusted and advocated for others to trust are failing. Elections that people devoted countless hours of toil and money to are being overturned in a blink by big spent by big 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 corporate high spender donors, okay? There is nothing within any electoral frame that can currently be done to affect that. Citizens United is not going to be overturned because the Supreme Court holds a Republican and an extreme Republican majority for the long foreseeable future. Only unforeseen acts of God could possibly change that at this current juncture. We are stuck with that, no matter who wins. The Supreme Court just made the Chevron decision 
which has completely and selectively, mind you, undermined the ability for Democrats to enforce any of their legislation. And by the way, the Chevron decision done by an unaccountable right-wing court under a Democratic president has actually undermined one of the aforementioned big wins from Joe, which is his climate deal. We now know that the climate deal cannot be enforced. In fact, just I didn't even update this this portion of the of the script since I got this news, but we just got news yesterday, perhaps late the day before, that Joe Biden's anti uh, anti discrimination uh, uh, decision, the decision to try and enforce anti discrimination for trans people, has been overturned. The courts uh, the courts ruled on Chevron, specifically on Chevron that actually no states and judges can choose to ignore that. We are witnessing the death of a religion. It was a religion that worshipped institutions and that taught that a life of abstracted political action is the only life available to you. It was a religion that taught that you do politics through acts of faith to a party, through acts of faith to a system. It is quite literally a trust the plan, but blue. I think that it's irresponsible that so many political public figures resort to convincing their audiences to functionally donate their time and energy to a church that will only offer them blind faith and empty promises. I don't believe that every YouTuber or politically interest, interested public figure needs to do like union organizing streams or protest streams or anything like that. And I'm not, that's not what I'm saying at all. But right now, there is a culture in left wing content creation of all types, streaming, video making, all of this, there is a culture of arrest. Political video makers and streamers seem to feel a knee-jerk need to defend what is and essentially be a volunteer PR wing for a system that is not working simply because it's an answer, any answer. But honesty and introspection is demanded of us if we truly believe that a dark time is coming. Telling audiences that you don't know the answer, at the very least, opens the door to finding an answer together. E energizing an audience to begin problem solving, process the processes of problem solving, is infinitely more useful than shunting everyone's energy off to be burned as fuel by Democrats who are neglectfully failing the entire world right now. I believe it is a very real and likely possibility that Donald Trump will win in November and will immediately begin using federal power that he and his allies have built to aggressively reshape America into a Trump-centric Christian nationalist country. I believe that trans people are in immediate danger of losing rights, facing persecution, and losing their livelihoods and even lives. I believe that immigrants are, are in great physical danger and face most of the same dangers that I just outlined before. I believe that police forces are in a position to rapidly advance horrifically anti-black, anti-immigrant, and anti-homeless agendas that are going to cost lives. I believe that most of the liberal sphere will agree with me on almost all of that. In fact, I believe it's reflected in messaging by the Democratic Party all the way up to even Joe Biden himself. You know, the threat to democracy stuff, which I, I agree, there is a threat to democracy. If all of these things are true, we must evolve and adapt to meet the moment. Endless social media antagonism with the only end goal of ultimately convincing people to at best donate more to Genocide Joe is not going to solve this if or when he eats shit in November. I also want to point out something, which is that 
I think there are a lot of people who operate this way. I don't think it's just liberals. I just think that they, the liberals are the hegemonic power, okay? As all of you who've ever watched me know, I have a, a extreme hatred for manipulative cult structures that trick people with false promises. I grew up in a literal cult, a religious cult that completely dominated the social, mental, and emotional lives of followers, convinced them to donate time and money and energy, their entire souls being consumed by a machine with promises of this and promises of that. Promises sometimes literally as vague as heaven. You'll, you'll have, you know, you're doing this for the kingdom of heaven. But churches aren't the only ones that use these type of tactics. Also, I want to point out that there is a similar structure that occurs uh, in certain far-left sections. Uh, things like the, the revolutionary optimism and the, uh, the, the endless march of the, the like orgs that spin up out of nowhere, these ML orgs and shit like that. The proletarian revolution is right around the corner. We just got to keep raising money for the revolution. The revolution is coming. That type of shit, by the way, which I've criticized endlessly on my stream, is the exact same type of thing that we are seeing right now working in the Democratic Party. I oppose it when it's done by MLs. I oppose it when it's done by Christian fundamentalists, and I oppose it when it's done by worshipers of state institutions. And I think that you should too, okay? Now there are a couple of, of, of critiques that I want to sort of get, I want to address directly. Some of these were voiced uh, by ContraPoints on social media. Um, and others I have seen, you know, in the fallout of this conversation, I have seen people talking about it. So I want to talk about one first, okay? Before we go any further. Here is the first one that I want to talk about right here. No one should constrain themselves entirely to procedural politics. But I do think that Trump regaining power would be very bad, and voting against him seems to me the likeliest way of stopping that particular problem. So that's the first one from ContraPoints. Keep that in your mind, okay? The, the next one that I want to bring up specifically here is this tweet. It starts, leftist movement, here we go. It starts up here. Literally every single right, this is uh, another user on Twitter who says, literally every single right you currently have were given and brought to you by leftist movements who fought against the capitalists who want you to live in abject poverty for their own coffers. Natalie responds, leftist movements who influenced elected officials. Yes, direct action is an essential component of any political progress, but it still matters who the elected officials are. It still matters who's on the Supreme Court. Now, this first comment here, it's been driving me crazy because, as I'll show in a minute, um, ContraPoints has responded this almost exact comment, I think literally this exact comment or some slight variation on it, to tons of people. It's This is quite literally... Uh, Michael Scott from the office doing the I declare bankruptcy. It's it's so frustrating. The idea that the only end goal is the declaration. The only end goal is an elected official saying, I hereby say, and not everything that built up to it. Is it's just, I'm going to go into that more in a second. I just needed to point out that like, I really, really, really think that this is a um, bad analysis. And I, I've tried here to uh, not be 
cruel or personal, but I, I want to challenge ContraPoints to think a little more deeply about whether or not the like crux of politics should be uh, like a declaration from some political figure. Because I just, I think that is a very bankrupt analysis and I think that it's very silly uh, when you think about it for more than a second. Um, which again, I'll go into some specific examples of this in a bit, but I want to get to the rest of this. Marcy responds, not necessarily. Slavery was abolished by monarchies few years after the Haitian Revolution. Natalie responds, not in the U.S., but in some other countries. Granted, sometimes revolutions can influence monarchs, but I feel like we're getting a little far away from the question of whether it's worth voting in the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Now, the reason why I read this one and the other one is because I believe we are, engage we are engaging with a Mott and Bailey. For those who are unfamiliar with what Amat and Bailey is, it's an argumentation ta tactic where when pressed, you put out a, cer a certain statement and then when you're confronted on it, you sort of retreat to a very easy and almost inarguable uh, statement. And, and I think this is a perfect example. And I want to show you what I mean, okay? I'm going to go back and quote something I quoted earlier on. In this tweet... ContraPoints tries to say it's just about whether or not you should vote at all in the 2024 election. But then, if we go back to the original thread, and I quote, As someone terrified by the prospect of Trump returning to power, can you reassure me that there is a plausible direct action non-electoralist means of stopping him that's more likely to succeed than electing Biden-Harris? Because if not, I think you're a LARPer. So the original thread says, if you can't promise a direct action or non-electoralist means of stopping Donald Trump from getting from taking office, you are a LARPer. And then, so that's the little, that's the wall. And then you retreat to the, oh, it's just, it's just about whether or not you should vote or not. I find that really frustrating and dishonest. And I think it's sad because um, I do think this topic is really important. And I also believe that not only are a lot of people engaging in this exact uh, uh, s sort of crappy, fallacious argument, um, but I think that all, everyone who engages in it is, that I've seen is better than this. I know that ContraPoints is smarter than using a tactic like that. I agree. Uh, I'm just going to highlight in chat, Gutter Bunny says, this is actually defeatist doomerism. I 100% agree with you. It is very popular right now for liberals and liberal leftists to call people um, uh, doomers all the time, but their position is quite literally, there is nothing but Biden, and if Biden doesn't win, we're toast. And it goes really far, okay? Because I want to point out one other thing, okay? I feel like I just want to, en I want to engage with ContraPoint's words here fairly, Okay? User says, at what point will moving to Europe not seem ridiculous or alarmist anymore and actually sound like a reasonable decision? And ContraPoint says, we're there. I am arranging to be out of the country by inauguration day if Trump wins, and we'll have to set up funds to get as many of the most vulnerable people out as we can. Now, I truly hope that, that's tr that, that ContraPoints means it and will set up funds to help vulnerable people. I truly, truly, truly hope that that's the case. We'll see. Of course, we'll have to see if that actually pans out, but I truly hope that ContraPoints will help others get out. So I find it, to, all of this is to say, I find it hard to believe that, uh, uh, that, that the, the Biden camp, the Biden is the only option camp is not supremely doomer. It's if Biden doesn't win, which I don't have any way of personally influencing besides getting mad at other people on the internet, 
uh, I will run away. And hopefully other people will run away too. Also, Europe is, uh, there's a lot of, Europe has a lot of problems politically, okay? The far right is also on the rise in Europe as well. Not all of Europe, but in certain areas of Europe, it's pretty bad. Anti-electoralism, okay, is a convenient straw man to, to a lot of liberal and liberal leftist commentators. They say it, and then they conveniently never meaningfully define it. It's like the woke, but of the left, okay? There are very few anti-electoralist people that I know personally, and I know a lot of people who are anti-electoralist. I consider myself anti-electoralist. No, none of these people advocate for never voting. At all. Anti-voting is not the same thing as anti-electoralism, okay? These are just not the same things, okay? Anti-electoralism is a position that says that your politics should not be built around electoralism. That, elect, that electoral politics is a machine designed to squeeze you dry for someone else's benefit. And it is. How can you not look at the current state of the Democratic Party and conclude that this is a machine that is literally burning millions of dollars? A, they got like $300 million dollars in the in 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 the month of June from donors all for Joe Biden to completely and utterly preventably mind you bomb absolutely horrifically in the debate and when i say bomb we know that his closest confidants knew that he's struggling there has been so much information that has come out these concerns have been around for a long time Joe Biden has been struggling for a very long time and he's been getting hundreds of millions of dollars per month from donors and setting it on fire. And there's a very good chance that Donald Trump will win in November and all of those hundreds of millions of dollars given to Joe Biden will have done jack shit. Except for, I guess you could argue, pay the salaries of some people, which is good for them. Good for them. Today... Joe Biden uh, reasserted publicly that he is not going to be stepping down, despite the fact that he's not getting any better. Since the debate, he has had multiple public gaffes, and the, uh, the, there has been no resolution of, uh, of morale within the Democrats. He has been plummeting in the polls. It is clear that things are only going to get worse for Joe Biden. Joe Biden has put out a statement since the debate that his team has put out a statement, I should say, that he will no longer be doing activities after 8 p.m. because he needs to get his sleep. The president is sundowning, okay? I'm sorry, but we need to conclude it. He's sundowning. We can all see it. And it's not that it's impossible for there to be improvements in the lives of people who are struggling with what is likely some form of dementia, but sundowning is kind of a pretty serious sign. And usually you can't, you know, make improvements in your day-to-day -day life while also trying to be the president. That's just not how any of this works. And they're not gonna do anything. And people, and they're asking you to donate more of your time, more of your energy. Anti-electoralists say what I said just a little bit ago, which is that why the fuck would you ever spend your time? Why would you ever advocate as somebody who seriously cares about a coming dark age in America? Why would you ever advocate for people to throw their lives away do donating and volunteering for the Democratic Party? which has already shown that they don't give a shit about you. They don't give a shit about winning. They are too hung up on Joe Biden's ego. There is so much that we can do. 
we can't stop Donald Trump from taking the presidency. Or else, I should say, it is very, very difficult and extremely unpredictable. There is a very, very good chance that no matter what any of us do, even Joe Biden, that Donald Trump will take the presidency in November again and will immediately begin constructing Project 2025. For all of the people listening to this right now, for all of the people who saw ContraPoints' tweet, all of the people who engaged in all this discourse, everybody who watches political content, you all got to think about that. You are not, none of you are Joe Biden. And if Joe Biden can't even stop it, we need to put our energy elsewhere. Even if that energy is just going to figuring out, to asking the questions. This is what I meant when I said that there is a culture of arrest on the online liberal left. There is a knee-jerk reaction to anybody who tries to talk about anything that isn't spending more time with the Democrats. I've literally heard huge lefty content creators say that the only path forward is through the Democratic Party. That is delusion! And it's wrong! And it's bad and it's deleterious! It's wrong to tell people that! You're telling people to go to church, to pray harder, instead of saying, maybe I don't have the answer. Um, let's start putting our heads together. Instead of encouraging your audience to start in their own lives thinking about what they can do to insulate them from a psychopath who is likely to take power in November, people are sitting there going, no, no, trust, trust in the Lord. I hate it. I'm disappointed and frustrated and infuriated. Real quick, Dat in YouTube chat says, maybe it's easier to ask questions in coalition build, not under fascism. No fucking shit! But you don't have that power. Who has the power to decide whether Donald Trump is going to win the election? Joe Biden could croak tomorrow. And the D Democratic Party hasn't even taken the time to set up a real heir. We've been talking about this for over a year. We've been talking about this for years now on this channel. This is the thing. That, is, that right there is the thought terminating cliche that I'm talking about. I think you should vote. Go vote. Do your vote. Get your little sticker. But let's acknowledge that your vote is very small. It's a good thing to vote. It's a good thing to vote locally. It's a good thing to pay attention to politics and know what might be coming your way. And what is coming our way, in all likelihood, is some pretty messed up shit. And as I pointed out, Joe Biden, even if he wins in November, still has to contend with a Supreme Court that has robbed him of his power. A Supreme Court that was chosen and targeted by right-wing forces in this country as a way to undermine any politics that aren't their own. Western Sentinel says, I agree with that, but why frame it all through the lens of anti-electoralism? It's self-defeating. No, it isn't. Did you not listen to anything that I said? Right now, you have energy. If I become an electoralist and I say, all you got to do is go get out there and vote. Go door knock for the Dems. You will blow your time. You will set your time and energy and life on fire for nothing. But if I come on my stream and I say, you all out there have your own unique talents. Some of you are doctors. Some of you are programmers. Some of you are nurses. Some of you are, uh, are website hosts. Some of you are super savvy and know how to store and transfer media of all types all across the internet. Some of you know how to get, how to smuggle forbidden media in countries that ban uh, anything that mentions the word gay. If I tell you to use those skills however you can, if I tell you to band together and start coming up with solutions now, I'm not telling you to waste your time. People who go out and live their lives right now doing everything except for electoralism are doing a hundred times more. If you're out there helping people live another day, you are ensuring that there will be a never, there will be a happy, healthy, 
and hearty resistance to anything that Donald Trump wants to do. But if you spend your time fucking burning your energy for the Democratic Party, you might eat shit in November, T Donald Trump takes over, and then what? No network, no nothing. I want people that are watching this now, that watch ContraPoints, I want people to start thinking about what they can do with the power they have, however small or big. I want them to think about what they can actually do to help people survive to prepare. This is why I take an anti-electoral position. Not anti-voting for the nine millionth time, but anti-electoral. I don't believe that the average everyday person should spend their time becoming a slave to the democratic machine. They have enough fucking slaves. They have enough yes men. Why would I ever tell anyone to become that? This is what I'm talking about, okay? We are stuck. The, the liberal left sphere is stuck, okay? And not, not in the fun way, okay? They're bound up in themselves. They are not prepared. We are getting lapped. We are watching every day I log on and I see every left-leaning content creator I know despairing at the, at the Supreme Court as the world gets worse outside of their hands. I want us to evolve, okay? It's time. We have entered a new age, okay? We've entered an age of, of rot and, and, and schism. And it's time for us to change the way that we move around in the world, the way that we talk about politics. We can't keep falling into this lazy bullshit anymore. Let me ask you something real quick, just to wrap this off. If Donald Trump wins in November and puts in Project 2025, what then? Is everyone who's currently talking about electoralism are you going to keep advocating for electoralism when Donald Trump makes it literally impossible for, for, for anybody who's not a loyalist to get elected? Is that what people are going to do? Because it sounds to me like people have already given up. The electoral faction has acknowledged that they're getting lapped, that, uh, that, that, that the legalistic route is completely fucked. They just, they just can't adapt. And so they're raging at the wrong people. They're raging at imaginary non-anti-voting uh, people. And they're doing so with platforms at the cost of energizing people towards things that could save lives. I want people out there doing the things that I listed above. Helping trans people escape states. Uh, contributing to GoFundMes for survival funds, gathering important information, sharing knowledge that would otherwise be tied away, making copies of, storing, and keeping media that is being censored. I want people to collect books that have been censored by, by Ron DeSantis. I want people to collect the books and the media that has been banned by Utah. I don't even know what the governor name is there. Who cares? I want people to care about their environment, to start making it livable in ways that Donald Trump can't stop you from doing. And if he tries to stop you, I want you to work together with everyone you know to figure out how to undermine that. He's going to make rules that will require being pushed and resisted. Will you be able to do it? Will you have the connections necessary? Unfortunately, I think... And even I am guilty of this. I think a lot of left-leaning YouTube uh, l people, uh, they work themselves into isolation. They make themselves, uh, uh, they take paths that lead them away from real connection to other people. They become siloed off. And then in fear, they defend the status quo. And I even say this right now, that I even have been guilty of this. Now, I'm pretty good about admitting it and owning my mistakes, as you all know. Sometimes people get mad at me. But I want people to evolve. 
things need to change. I want people to change. You don't have to do uh, you know, uh, uh, a stream where every stream you boot up and you're, you're talking about every radical action. In fact, I think that would probably not be beneficial. I just want people to stop fucking wasting people's time lying to them and trying to convince them to believe in a faith that is a lie. And to quote the great Duke Aldia, a lie remains a lie. Anyway, thank you for hearing me out. If you're watching live, make sure you check out the next section where we're going to go read some other responses to this thread that I think were notable. If you're watching this as a video, press subscribe down below and please leave me your comments letting me know what to think. I don't know, like I said, I don't know and I don't think that ContraPoints will ever actually see this video. But I hope the people who think like ContraPoints will and will think again. Thanks for watching.